Hello, I'm Scott Barry with Barry Consultants, a biostatistician. I get asked many times, how do you design an adaptive trial? What are the secrets to it? What, are the, what, what, what parts go into it? What are lessons learned? So what I'm gonna share with you today are my lessons learned. So far, we, as we go on, we learn more and more. So I will show you a little bit of the recipe on how to make an adaptive design. So the recipe is very simple. There's six parts to this in order. If you go out of order, you can mess up your, your, your meal at the end of the day, your design at the end of the day. So it always starts with the science. And this can be a series of meetings, a series of calls, but as I'll show you, I think it's critical you get the science right. Everything else follows from the science. Then you create skeleton design or designs, simulate them, Share your simulations. That part, by the way, is critical. If you share them in one way or another, you change where the design goes. So I'll, sh I'll talk to you about that. Iterate the design. You learned in the sharing that, oh, we should do this, we should do that. This iterates, and you continue this until it's done. And then at the end, to finish it off, you create an adaptive design report. Okay, so the background, the science. The most important part of this is the science. It's getting the decision problem right. You're creating a solution to a decision problem. You have to get this part right. You, if, if you, each time you create a unique solution to that problem. You don't want the mindset that, oh, I've got this nice adaptive design, I wanna hit that nail with my design. It's the opposite of it. This is the stage where you've got to listen You've got to ask the right questions to probe what are they trying to do. You're going to simulate trials and show them how well this trial works or how well it doesn't work. And you have to capture what, what does work mean. And if you don't know the goals of this, you will summarize things incorrectly and you'll get the same reaction. I don't really care about statistical significance. I don't care about that. My goal is the following. You need to understand the therapy. How does it work? What do we know about it? What don't we know about it is critical to help the design learn that. Why this treatment? What will it be compared to? Learn about the disease. Learn about the history of the disease. What has worked? What doesn't work? How important are subgroups? Every disease is heterogeneous. What heterogeneity? What does it mean in your trial? Are there biomarkers? How might they play a role? What are the endpoints of the trial? What are the regulatory issues? What is phase three going to look like if this is not a phase three trial? What are constraints? Drug supply, costs, uh, what does marketing think about this? And the most important part of this is what is success? You have to be able to, to metric, create a metric for success and failure. Know when you've reached success, know when you've reached failure. Okay, these are some helpful questions to ask to get at each of those areas. Ask why are you doing this study? You may get an answer like, well, I have to find the dose response. But probe into that. What is it about the dose response you wanna know? The minimally effective dose, the ED90, the optimization of efficacy and safety. Why are you doing this study? That will help you measure at the end of the day, was it good or not? What happens after this study? Do we do a phase three? Under what circumstances do we do another phase two? When do we quit? Uh, get a clear definition of success. That if you simulate a trial and it looks like this, everybody agrees that's success. A clear definition of failure. How do you know when you're done and the therapy has failed? Uh, ask the following question. Get the, at the idea of anticipated regret. If this trial fails, in your imagination of this trial, what do you wish you would have done? You might get, I would have tried a different patient population. I would have tried a higher dose. I would have tried a lower dose. I would have tried more doses. This also comes out of what you do next in a failure, what you do next in a gray area. So getting anticipated regret will help you to design that into the current trial. Allow it to go bigger so that you can learn more in this single trial. Uh, an interesting question is, and this is a question that, that's strange uh, in, in the history of our clinical trials where you can't look at the data, is if you could look at the data halfway through, 
what would you do? What would you change in the trial if you could look at it? What would you look at in order to decide would you change it? These are all different kind of questions that statisticians don't typically ask, but it really allows you to get at why are we doing this trial and what unique solution I can create for it. At the end of the day, you need to know the arms, the maximum sample size, what are the endpoints, do we model the arms and the doses, what, is the, what are the accrual rates? That's a new thing for statisticians as well. Adaptive designs critically need accrual rate. They depend on the time to information, so accrual rate becomes a really important part of that, and what adaptations might even be available to you as a, as a designer. What about missing data? How much do we expect? When does it become missing? And you've got to create a working definition of success. Is it that we would go to phase three? Is it statistical significance? Is it 50% probability this works? Uh, you need to create what that definition of success is, finding the right dose. Okay, then you create a skeleton design. After those first sequence of meetings, you present a skeleton all of the adaptations, the modeling, and the definition of success is a critical part to this. And you present to them the skeleton, no simulations yet, just the skeleton. Does this look like this would work? And if they shake their head, yeah, yeah I think it would work. It seems really cool, can we do that? Now you enter the third stage where you now simulate that skeleton. You may iterate step two. They may say, oh, I don't like this. We can't do this. And that's more of the learning process as well. Eventually, you'll get to a skeleton design. Now you have to do full-scale, real-time simulations. You're simulating patients walking in the door, being randomized. You're simulating the time to information, perhaps dropouts. Uh, you, so you simulate that entire process, the analyses that you've set out in your adaptations. You're simulating the real trial. Create four to eight scenarios that challenge the design. Null scenarios, incredibly drug, strong drug effects, gray area effects, strange shapes to the effects, but four to eight. You don't want to overwhelm them yet. Uh, you, you need to just have some so they can see what the design looks like in several of them. And during your simulation, you have to create example trials of what the trial looks like and operating characteristics. That becomes the next step. The step that statisticians aren't always good at, but this becomes the clear communication step. It's like taking the, the, the meal out of the oven too quickly. It, it, the, the whole meal is ruined at this point. You have to be able to communicate the simulations you did. And it's hard for us as statisticians. Simulations are such a natural thing to us. We think about power and type one error as simulations, that the, the analytical calculations we've made in a fixed trial in the way we understand them as simulations. I, I promise you others do not think that way. We're different than other people, I promise you that. You won't be surprised by that. But they don't think about simulations the way we do. They tend to think about them that somehow we're predicting what's gonna happen. And we're using simulations to challenge the design we want the design to work well. We're less interested right now in predicting the results of the trial. This is very new to people, so you have to walk them through example trials. Again, it's a huge mistake if you skip this step. Walk them through two to three simulated trials. They'll see how the data fits in with the model, with the adaptations. If you jump right to operating characteristics, they miss that and they will ask you questions that demonstrate they completely missed that step. So show them example trials, and then they will ask you before you get to operating characteristics, well, that, that's one trial. What if I do this twice or a thousand times? And you naturally walk into the operating characteristics. So set up the sharing of simulations in a way that this demystifies the design. You need to communicate very, very well, or they might just say, oh, we're not going to do this. It doesn't work. We're not going to do it because they never understood it. You didn't communicate it properly. All right. Here's an example of a simulated trial, a single trial. Uh, the Y space is efficacy. It's two separate populations. By the way, this is the ice cap trial, if, if you're familiar with that. We have different durations of hypothermic cooling on the x-axis for the two rhythm types. 
of cardiac arrest. I'm not going to go into too much of the detail, but I would walk them through what this slide means. The data are the open circles. The mathematical model is the solid red circles. The blue is the probability each duration is optimal. And I walk them through every update of this. I get new patients. We do adaptive randomization. And they can see how does the data fit in? How does the model fit in? How do the adaptations fit in? And they see what an example trial looks like. And then at the end of this, I can tell them, and notice I haven't, there's a really nice thing to do. Don't tell them what the assumption was that simulated the data. They will immediately ask, and you want to place them as though they're watching the trial and only the data. So I haven't told them at this point, and I wouldn't tell them, until the very end of the trial. So I walk it out to the end, and now black is actually the truth of how I simulated the data. I would explain that that's the truth, here's the answer we got. Lo and behold, in rhythm one, we got exactly the optimal du duration. Rhythm two, we missed by one, but a little bit higher, which was on the plateau, and walk them through that trial. They understand single trials. It's hard for them to understand operating characteristics. Here's now the average of 5,000 of these trials where I summarize the sample size the duration of, of cooling in this, in each rhythm type, and now they understand what this means. Otherwise, they would not if I had gone straight to this. In future meetings, I might skip example trials if it really becomes they understand the language that you're working with. All right, now I iterate the design. It doesn't work for whatever reason. I change the design, I change the sample size, I change the number of durations. I got to that trial design, by the way, starting with three durations, and it was uncomfortable to them. What happens in the middle there? We jumped to 12 durations down to 10. That was the iteration of the sequence. The model changed in that case. A lot of, even the endpoint itself changed. So this iteration is critical to test them. You, all of the science you got originally changes when they see actual trials. So you continue this iteration, new simulations, new presentations, until the point you get your design. We've got a design, we've got a model, we've got all of that set up. Now the communication is an adaptive design report. You write out the design completely prospectively, every detail of the model, all the priors, all the, the individual tests if you're doing frequentist statistics. You write it out so that somebody else could pick it up and run exactly the same trial. It, all of the detail goes into this. This then feeds the protocol, but this can become an appendix to the protocol. It's important for IRBs, for regulators, for CROs running the trial. You can detail it. Now, if you're using simulation for proof of type 1 error, you have an extensive section of that. Otherwise, you're going to have a healthy 10 to 20 scenarios that really test the design, that demonstrate what it does. This becomes a huge communication tool for your newly baked adaptive design. So good luck and go get them.